can use the device's camera in order to capture an image and show it in our application. For that reason, let's create an image view in our layout file. But before that, let's delete this form and let's change this constraint layout to a relative layout. Image view, let's say 250 dp. Let's also initialize this uh, image view in our main activity. Before everything, in order to have access to the user's device's camera, you need to have camera permission in your manifest file. Let's add that permission in our manifest. Down in here, I can say uses permission. This one in here, android.permission.camera. For internet permission, this was enough and uh, you didn't need to do anything further in order to have the permission to have access to the internet. But uh, for camera, it's different. Generally, normal permissions like internet and Wi-Fi are not dangerous and the uh, Android system automatically grant those permissions to your application. But for dangerous uh, permissions like camera, you need to ask them at the runtime uh, from the user. Uh, and user can decide if uh, he or she grants this permission to your application or denies the permission. And the way you ask for user's permission is like this. In your main activity on create method, you can say if activity compat, this one that comes from android.support.v4.check self permission to pass a context which I'm going to pass this and a string for the permissions that you want to ask for example I can say manifest dot permission dot camera let's minimize this project pane for now if this sentence in here is not equal to package manager dot permission granted this flag in here with the help of this check self permission, you are checking that if your application has the permission to access the camera or not. And if it does not have that permission, you can say activity compat once again, dot request permissions this time. Once again, you need to pass activity and also a string array for all the permissions that you want to ask for. I can say new string. Let's say manifest dot permission dot camera in here. You can ask for multiple permissions at the same time, but for now, uh, let's just leave it as one. And as the third argument in here, you need to pass a specific code. And later on, depending on that, you can check if uh, your application has successfully received the user's permission or not. Uh, we will see how we can use this request code in a minute. Later on, you can overwrite another method in your main activity called on request permission result. And you can check if user has granted this permission to your application or not. And the way you do that is by coming down in here and create a switch statement. Depending on the request code that you are receiving up in here as the inputs of this method, you can say in case it's one, the number that you had entered in here. Let's also write the default case. In case it's fun, I can say if grant results, this one in here, this uh, integer array list, dot length is greater than zero. And if grant result, dot first element is equal to package manager, dot permission granted then it means that I have the permission let's put an else in here let's just toast message permission denied 
It's also better to use the constants instead of numbers manually in here because uh, there will be a lot of numbers, a lot of requests, and it might get confused sometimes. So for that reason, let's uh, create a private static final int. Let's change this one to private. Let's call it camera request code is equal to one. Later on, I can pass this constant in here. Let's say camera. And also down in here, I can say in case it's camera request code, then uh, check if we have the permission. Before we go on, let's run our application and let's see what have we done. If you have an Android device, this little dialog might be familiar for you. And you can see that uh, Android system has popped up this dialog and is asking for the camera permission. I can deny it and allow the permission. Let's deny it for now. You can see that permission denied. In your application, you need to handle different situations for denying and allowing permissions by the user. And in the next video, we will see how exactly we are going to handle different situations not just allow and deny, but if I run it uh, one more time, this time the dialog is a little bit different. We have this checkbox in here. If the user check this checkbox and deny the permission for our application, next time we run our application, we wouldn't get that pop-up dialog. And the permission has been denied permanently. The user can only grant the permission uh, to our application in the settings. In the next video, we will see how we can handle uh, this situation as well. But for now, let's just uninstall our application so that uh, we could see th that dialog next time we run our application. Okay, let's continue on with our code. But in case the user grants the permission to our application, how we can capture an image? Well, the way to do that is by coming to this if block where we are sure we had the permission. I can create an intent in here. Intent intent is equal to new intent. I can say android.provider.mediastore.action image capture, this first flag in here. But as you can see, IntelliJ has changed my code to media store. It really doesn't matter at this point. Up until this point, all the intents that we have used were used to navigate the user from one activity to another activity. But this in here is a different format of defining a new intent. By this way of defining an intent, we are uh, setting an action for that intent. And the action in here is to capture an image. There are a lot of actions for different intents and we are going to know a lot of them in this course. But for now, uh, this media store dot action image capture, as the name is descriptive, is going to capture an image for us. But another difference in here is that up until this point, we always set start activity and passed our intent. But in here, we need the image that we are going to capture. So we need the result for that matter. I can say the start activity for result this time this one down in here start activity for result and i can pass my intent this time but that's not enough you need to pass a request code as well because multiple intent can trigger multiple actions and later on all of these would be handled uh, in one single method let's add a, another constant up in here so that we could differentiate between different actions private static final int let's call it Capture image is equal to two. Let's see. let's pass this constant in here. Right now, if I open the application, if the user grants the camera permission, it would open the camera for the user. But uh, there is no way of uh, handling the image that comes back from the camera. And the way to handle that image is by overriding another method in your main activity called on activity result. This one in here. In here, I can say if the request code is equal to the camera request or capture image, whatever that is. And also, 
if the result code this one that we are receiving from here is equal to result ok or basically activity dot result ok it's an inner constant just for uh, indicating if we have any result or not if these two conditions are met then we can use this data item in here in order to save the image or maybe show that in our application and the way you do that is by creating a try catch and catch null pointer exceptions because a lot of things can happen during uh, capturing an image for example our application could be interrupted by a call or something then we want to avoid these null pointer exceptions v.print stack trace and inside this try block i can say bitmap bitmap is equal to data this intent that we are receiving up in here dot get extras dot get with data a string in here but right now this on activity result method has no idea of what this data could be we need to cast this one to a bitmap in here as well then we can use this bitmap object in order to let's say show it in our application for example i can say image view dot set image bitmap this new method we haven't seen this uh, before to the bitmap that we just created let's run our application and see if we can capture an image and show it in our application once again it's asking me for the camera permission let's allow it this time you can see that camera has been opened but this is an emulator and it doesn't really have a camera it's just uh, simulating a camera you can plug in your real device and run your application in that device in that case it would open your uh, real camera uh, i can capture a picture in here and if i confirm it it will navigate back to our application and the image that we just captured is being shown to that image view that we defined here in our activity main layout file but now that we have granted uh, camera permission for this application this application would always uh, have that permission unless we uncheck uh, or revoke that permission from uh, the settings uh, for example if i try running it once again it's not going to ask any permission but uh, because we want to open the camera in that case as well we need to define an intent in here in this if statement we are checking that if we have the camera permission or not and if we don't have that we are going to request that else if we have that we are going to once again create our intent in here new intent media store dot action image capture start activity for result intent and our capture image constant let's try running it once again our application is opening the camera without asking for the permission that seems fine there are a lot of new topics in here for example this media store that action image capture it's basically coming from a content provider we will be talking about content providers in two sessions from now and uh, we will talk in details about content providers what those are how we can use them also this uh, bitmap down in here it's a file and it can be up to two or three megabytes and if you aren't careful about this bitmap about the usage of it it can really uh, occupy all the cache memory and maybe uh, cause memory leaks we have dedicated an entire session about working with files as well how we can use them how we can convert them rename them maybe uh, convert them to a byte array later on maybe upload them to our web server but for now we just uh, are going to use this one bitmap it's not going to harm our application in any way and also uh, the other topic is these permissions in the next video uh, we are going to see the best way that we can handle the different permissions for our application if the user grant the permission if deny a permission if deny permission permanently 
and if our application depends on that permission. We are going to handle all of those situations. See you in the next video. In the previous video, we have talked a little bit about permissions in Android. Let's talk a bit more about them. As I said at the previous video, for some permissions like internet permission, you just declare them in your manifest file and Android system will automatically grant those permissions. These are called normal permissions. If you want to take a look at all the normal permissions, you can check this web page at Android Developers Official website. Basically, uh, things like Bluetooth, NFC, uh, even network states and all sorts of permissions that you can see in here all are normal permissions and will be automatically granted by the Android system. And the reason that Android system automatically grants the user and uh, doesn't prompt uh, anything to the user is that because these are basically safe permissions and they don't endanger the user's privacy. Make sure to check this list uh, at all times because they keep updating this list. They sometimes delete uh, some of the permissions from this list and also add uh, some to this list. So make sure to uh, check it regularly. It's also a good time to say that permissions in API level 23 and lower were asked at the installation time. But uh, since API 23 and higher, you ask the permission at the run time like we did in the previous video. But no need for you to be worried about that by using that activity compat that we have used in the previous video. The Android system will handle the compatibility between different versions of API. But let's talk about how exactly we are going to handle permissions in Android system. Well, this is the kind of behavior that we might want for our applications. For example, when I click at this take photo, Simply we are going to ask for the user's permission. If we deny the permission, we will keep asking the user until the user grant the permission or check this uh, checkbox in here and deny the permission for our application. But we are not done. This element in here is a snack bar. We haven't seen this in uh, the course up until this point. It's basically coming from design support library and we are going to use it in this video. When the user check that checkbox and deny uh, the permission for our application, we are going to show a snack bar which has a button in here. If I click on this grant permission, it navigates us to this page in the application setting which you can click on this permission and grant the permission from here. If the user don't grant the permission uh, from here and goes back to our application, once again we are going to show the snack bar. And if the user grant the permission from here and go back then we are going to open the camera this is the exact kind of behavior that we need for our application if our application depends uh, on the permission okay let's implement this behavior in our application first of all let's create the layout file resources activity main constraint layout to relative layout also, I'm going to give an ID to this relative layout. Later on, we will see how we can use this. I'm going to simply give it an ID of parent. Let's delete this text view and add our image view and our button. Okay, let's initialize all of these in our Java class. In the previous video, we have checked and asked for the permission in this onCreate method, but that's not a good point in this application because you only want to ask for the permission when your app needs it. And in this application, we want uh, the permission when we click on the button. So let's check and ask for the permission in the button on click listener. I can say btn take dot set on click listener new on click listener like in the previous video i can say if activity compat dot check self permission 
as the context, main activity dot this, and also manifest dot permission dot camera. If it's not equal to package manager dot permission granted. In here, I'm going to use another method called activity compat dot should show request permission rational in here. Let's pass the argument and we will talk about it. First of all, we need the activity main activity dot this and also the permission manifest dot permission dot camera. Let's also add a uh, explanation mark in here if not should show request permission rational but what is this long named method well the request permission rational is that exact dialog that we have seen we are checking that if uh, we can show that dialog or not for example we have seen that uh, if the user checked that checkbox and uh, denied the permission we wouldn't be able to uh, show that request permission rational or show that dialog. If we are not able to uh, show that dialog, we are going to show our snack bar. But first of all, let's create uh, the else in here. If we can show, simply we are going to say activity compat dot request permission main activity dot this new string manifest dot permission dot camera and also request code let's create the request code up in here uh, private static final int let's say camera permission request is equal to one then in here let's pass that constant so to have a quick review, if we can't show that dialog, we are going to show the snack bar. But if we can, we are going to uh, request for the permission. For the snack bar, we need to implement design support library in our application. So let's do that. You can find its dependency from Android developers official website. Let's copy it in our Gradle file. The way that you create a snack bar at the runtime is like this. In here I can say snack bar dot make. And here is the part that uh, this parent is going to be useful. The ID that we have give to our relative layout. We need to pass it in here as the parent view. Then I need uh, a text in here which simply I'm going to say uh, this app needs uh, camera permission. Then after this, I need to uh, specify the time that I'm going to uh, show my snack bar. As you can see in here, the first one is length indefinite. It will uh, indefinitely will be on the screen unless we uh, set an action for our snack bar. Like toast, we have uh, long and short in here as well. Okay, let's select this indefinite. Let's also uh, set an action uh, for our snack bar. I'm talking about that pink text that you have seen a few minutes ago. As it's text to say uh, grant permission. And also we need a new unclear snack. First of all, let's show our snack bar. Inside this unclick, I'm going to create an intent that would uh, navigate the user to the application setting page. And the way you can do that is by creating a new intent and set its action to uh, settings dot action application detail settings. Once again, it's uh, coming from a content provider. We will be talking about content providers in future videos. Also in here, we need to uh, say intent dot set data and we need to pass a URI in here. We will be talking about URI in the content provider session but basically URI is the address of our application in the Android environment. Actually, if you want to have a better uh, idea, URLs uh, like different web page addresses are a kind of URI and it contains uh, different parts like the HTTP part. But of course, in the URI that I'm going to pass in here, we don't have a HTTP or something. 
Don't worry about the concept of URI. We will be talking uh, in detail about this URI in content providers uh, session. I can say URI dot parse. We are going to parse a text in here. First of all, I'm going to say a package with a column and a plus get package name. This text in here will be uh, parsed to the URI that will contain the address of our application and will navigate uh, the user to the settings uh, page in the devices setting. Then I can say start activity and pass my input. Let's also override the on request permission result method and uh, test our application. On request permission result like previous video I can say switch on the request code in case it's a camera permission request we can say if grant result dot length is greater than zero and also grant result with a zero index is equal to package manager dot permission granted it means that we have the permission, we can create our intent and uh, navigate the user to the camera or open the camera application. Media store.action image capture, start activity for result and pass our input. And also we need a request code in here. Let's create that request code up in here. And also let's pass it down in here. But if we don't have the permission in else case, once again, we are going to check that if we could show uh, the request permission rational or not. If we uh, can show that, simply we are going to request for the permission. But if we cannot, we are going to show our snack bar once again. So I can copy this logic from here and copy it uh, in the else case. Okay, let's override the on activity result method and uh, set the image for our image view in the like the previous video. I can say if request code is equal to image capture request code and also if the result code is equal to result okay. Sorry, I need to change this one to result code, not request code. If these two conditions are met, I need a try catch in here, which will catch the null pointer exceptions. E dot print stack trace. I can say bitmap. Bitmap is equal to data. I can say data dot get extras dot get. I can pass data uh, as the key. And also I need to cast this one to a bitmap. After that, I can say image view dot set image bitmap to the bitmap. The final step in here is to add the permission in our manifest and run the application. Uses permission, camera permission, and let's see if we are doing fine. This is the first time that I have run this application, and if I click on take a photo. I think uh, I have the wrong condition in here because it should show us the dialog. Uh, in here, I think I need to uh, delete this explanation mark. I'm sorry about that. Take a photo. Yes, it is working fine. We just needed to change the condition in here. We didn't need the explanation mark up in here. Okay, if I deny the permission in here, we are uh, seeing the grant permission snack bar. If I click on this grant permission, we will be navigated back to uh, the application setting permission and I can grant the permission from here. If I grant it and go back to the application, if I uh, click on take a photo, uh, seems like nothing would happen and the reason is in this uh, bit and take, I never uh, created an intent to open the camera. In here, we are checking uh, that if we have the permission, if we don't have it, uh, we are asking for the permission, but I need to write an else 
plug in here and create my intent to open the camera. Start activity for result. Intent and our image capture request code constant. Let's try running it once again. Now our application has the permission, so it shouldn't request for one. Take a photo and it's opening the camera. It seems fine. But if your application uh, don't have the permission and you don't request for one and try to open the camera, you will get something called a security exception. And your application would definitely uh, have crashes and everything. Okay, this was good for our application, but there are some times that uh, you want your application to request for the permission in the onCreate method, like we did in the previous video. For those times when uh, you come back from the settings, it's uh, better to override the onStart and check all of these uh, logic, for example, this uh, should request permission rational and uh, activity compound request permission in the onStart as well, so that it wouldn't be dependent on the clicking on the button. Okay, this video is getting a little bit long. In this video and the previous video, I just wanted to talk about capturing an image and how to handle uh, permissions in Android. In the next video, we are going to start talking about room database. See you in the next video. Up until this point in this session, we have learned about different SQL commands. Also, we have learned how to implement the SQL database in our Android application. We have learned how to insert data to the database, how to read data, how to update and delete data. And also, we have learned how to upgrade our database. But now, let's talk a bit about something called Room Database. Room Database is a part of something called Android Architecture Component. Those are a set of libraries that would help you to have a solid, understandable and bug-free application. We will be talking about the architecture in an entire session in a few sessions later, but for now let's talk about Room Database. Room Database is a wrapper around the SQLite database and uh, it has a lot of benefits compared to SQLite. One of its benefits is that if you make some mistake at uh, creating tables and also inserting data at the wrong table, you would get a compile time error and not like SQLite at the runtime error that would cause your application to crash. The other benefit is that Room Database works greatly with other components of Android architecture components and later on in the future sessions we will see how we can integrate uh, with different components of Android architecture components. And also Room Database works greatly with uh, live data. We will be talking about live data in few videos later, but for now you just need to know that live data is very useful when, for example, uh, some changes happen to your database. For example, if you update some records in your database, you don't need to listen for those changes in your database. With the help of live data, the views that are using uh, those live data would automatically update. Also, live data is a life cycle ever and you don't need to be worried about uh, things like different configuration changes like rotating the device and everything. Let's talk about live data in a few videos later in its own place, but for now let's talk about room database. In a room database, instead of tables, you create new entities. Basically, entity is a Java class which is annotated with the keyword entity. You define an entity exactly as you defined a POJO object. Also, in every room database, you have an interface called DAO or data access object related to every entity that would handle the operations that you want from your database. For example, if you want to insert, update, delete, or query your database, uh, you can use uh, those DAO or data access objects. All of these interfaces and uh, entities would come together in a class that would extend from Room Database and that would be our uh, application's database. 
Okay, instead of talking, uh, let's implement the room database in our application. Let me close this project and start from the beginning because uh, we are going to need Android X in this video. In the latest version of Room, uh, you can only work with Android X. Close this project, create a new one, empty activity, check this Android X. First thing, uh, let's call our project Room Database. When your project is successfully built, it's time to get the room dependencies. You can find them by saying room database dependency. The first link is probably our needed link. You can see the dependencies in here, but all of them are not necessary. For example, this one is for Kotlin, this one is for integrating with RxJava, this one for Gava, and this one is for testing. But uh, the ones that we need is uh, these two in here, the room itself and its annotation processor. Also, this uh, variable in here, we need that as well. Copy them into your Gradle file and sync your project. Let's start by creating an entity, which I said that is equivalent to a table in SQLite uh, database. New Java class, as always. It's like defining a new model. I'm going to call it a student and leave everything else as default. First of all, let's come before and the declaration of this class. In here, we need an annotation. I can uh, create annotation by typing at, and the one that we need in here is called entity. I'm not sure if I talked about annotations before, but basically when you use annotations, behind the scenes, uh, there are a lot of codes that has been produced. For example, in here, this student class, with the help of the codes that this uh, entity annotation is going to create, will be converted to a SQLite database. Like any other Java class, in here we can have fields. For example, private int uh, id, private string name. Instead of defining the columns, in here we define the fields for a class. Let's add two more fields in here, private string email and private string phone number. By default, the name of the table that is going to be created uh, would be this student. You can change it, for example, in here, after this entity, you can open and close a parenthesis. You can type table name, and uh, in here you can specify the name that you want. For example, I can say students in here. Uh, of course, you know that SQLite databases are case sensitive, so uh, make sure to don't do any mistakes. Every entity in room database needs at least one primary key column and the way you define that before uh, creating that ID, that uh, column you can say add primary key, this annotation in here and inside the parentheses you can say auto generate to true. This auto generate is like auto increment in SQLite commands. This way our ID would be a primary key. And also, you can have uh, multiple primary keys inside a table. If you want your Java class to have uh, different field names than the column names in SQLite database, you have that option. For example, in here, I want my phone number to be written like this. But in my SQLite database, I like it like it was previous. I can do that by specifying another annotation in here called uh, column info. I can specify the name that I want in here. For example, let's say phone number. Also, room database needs a constructor for every entity that you create. You can create your constructor as you did for every other classes in Java. But in here, because this ID is auto generate, I don't need to be worried about it because uh, I don't know what it would be in my database. Uh, I can uh, Ignore it for the constructor. But if you ignore this column in here, you need to uh, create a setter for that column. For example, in here for the ID, I need a setter or room database needs this setter. And also room database needs you to create getters for uh, all the other fields. If you want to have multiple constructors in here, for example, a constructor that would uh, 
get only the name and email you can have that but you need to annotate it with uh, ignore let's do that in here you can say add ignore at the time of creating your table this constructor would be ignored as this annotation in here it says but i don't need this constructor so let's delete it that's all you need to do in order to create an entity in room database Let's create that DAO object that I was talking about, data access object. I said that it's going to be an interface, so let's say new Java class and change the kind to interface. You can have one DAO for multiple tables or multiple entities, but it's better to have uh, one DAO for every entity in your room database. I'm going to call it a student DAO. First of all, I need to annotate this one, uh, like entity, to DAO. Inside this DAO, I can uh, define all the operations that I want to do on my database. For example, if I want to insert records into database, I can create an abstract method in here. Let's say void insert, and let's receive a student. Later on, from different parts of your application, you call this method and pass the student that you want to insert to your database, and uh, everything else is being handled by uh, the room database. But uh, before that method, you need to annotate it with this at insert annotation. Like insert, you have other options for deleting. Let's annotate deleting here. Let's say void delete the student that you want to delete that's all later on you just pass a student and uh, it would be deleted upon the student IDs it will look at your database in your tables and uh, it will delete all the students with the IDs that you pass to this student you have the option for update in here as well void let's say update and once again you need to pass a student like delete this update would work upon the ID that uh, this student has also like a SQLite database this uh, update would return an integer indicating uh, the number of rows that has been affected you can uh, use this uh, integer and you can return it but for our application that wouldn't seem to be necessary but the main uh, part of every DAO object is annotated with this at query. This is where the magic happens. You can say a list of a student, the return type. Let's call it get all students, call our method. We don't need to pass anything in here, just inside this query annotation. I need to specify uh, the exact SQL command that I need. For example, I can say select a star from students and as you can see as I'm typing IntelliJ is suggesting me and that's because I'm using a room database we didn't have this option in SQLite uh, open helper class if I type the wrong table name in here I would get a compile time error and uh, my application would uh, go to the running stage it's always better to have a compile time error than uh, having a runtime crash you can have multiple queries in here. For example, let's create another one. This time, let's say, uh, select a star from students, where the ID is the ID that we are interested in. And once again, as you can see, it's suggesting me the column names, where ID is equal to the placeholder in a room database is this uh, column in here. I can say, ID and later on when I create my method I can say student as the return type of my method get student by ID I can pass my integer in here int ID this way this ID in here would be replaced by the ID that we pass to this method you can also have an array of uh, integers in here for example let's say IDs and of course I need to change this one to IDs this way at the runtime uh, room database would look for all the students with the IDs that has been saved inside this integer array 
Also for these uh, insert, delete and update ones, you can uh, insert multiple students uh, at the same time. For example, a student one and a student two at the same time. Or even you can have an array list of students. If you do that, uh, all of those students would be saved or inserted into your database at the same time. Similarly, you can uh, use them for delete and update. As I said before, it's useful to have a, a DAO object for every entity that you have in your own database. I'm done uh, with this DAO in here. Let's create our database itself. Let's create that class. Let's call it University Database. But the database class in Room Database needs to be abstract. And also it needs to extend uh, from Room Database, the one that comes from Android X.Room. Every class that is going to be represented as the Room Database needs to have three conditions. First of all, it needs to annotate with this uh, at database, the one that comes from Android X.Room. In here, you need to uh, define the entities for your database. If you have only one table, like I have in this application, you can say student.class. Or if you have multiple entities, you can put them inside an array, like in here. Let's add the student class in here as well. And after that, you need to define a version for your database, like in a SQLite database. For now, I'm just going to put one in here. The second condition is that your class to be abstract and extend from room database. The third condition is that in every database, you need a, a public abstract method that would return the DAO for every entity. I can say public abstract student DAO Let's call it student DAO. It needs to be a method, so we need two parentheses. This is the third condition of every database. You need this as well. Also, probably in most applications that are being executed at one process, you want your database to be singleton. I'm not sure if I talked about singleton pattern, but uh, it's useful when you want to have only one instance of uh, your class in your entire application. And this is the way that you implement the singleton pattern in your class. First of all, you need to create a private static member variable of the kind uh, of this class that you are in. For example, university database in here. Let's call it instance. Then you need a getter for this instance. Let's create one. But you need to change this getter a little bit. In here you can check if instance is null, it means that if it's the first time that you are calling uh, this get instance method, if instance is null, then create your instance of the database and uh, after that return the instance. But if it's not null, you are just going to return the static instance of the object. And because it is static, it would be same at all of your application. But right now this method in here is not safe if uh, two operations from two different threads uh, call this method. And for your method to be thread safe, you can add a Java keyboard in here called synchronized. We haven't seen this uh, keyboard up until this point. It's basically useful when you want your method to be uh, thread safe. Also in this get instance method, we need a context. Let's receive that and we will see in a minute why we are going to need this. In order to create an instance of your database, you can say instance is equal to room dot database builder. We need to pass our context in here. Then we need to pass this class itself. For example, I can say university database dot class. And after that, I need a name for my database. I can say university database. Then you can simply call dot build on this and uh, you have an instance of your database. But there are a lot of options that you have in here. 
for example one thing that I'm going to talk about in this video is called uh, fallback to destructive migration it's a weird name and basically migration means uh, that upgrade and downgrade that we have seen uh, in SQLite database whenever you change your database somehow for example add a column or maybe add a table to your database you would upgrade or downgrade your database this is basically uh, the migration but what is this fallback to destructive migration every time that you upgrade or downgrade your uh, ROM database you need to define a migration which we will uh, do in the next video but if the ROM database don't find the migrations if you don't uh, add this method in here uh, it would throw some exceptions but if you do use this uh, fallback to destructive migration it will delete uh, all your database and uh, create it from the beginning it's useful for the times that you want to avoid crashes and also you are not sure about your migrations but it will delete all the users data in the database it means that it will drop all the tables and will create them from the beginning so be careful about this fallback to destructive migration because if the user is saving uh, sensitive data into your database if you use this and if the user uh, update uh, the application and you had to change this version all of the user's data would be deleted so be extra careful about this one in here there are a lot more functionalities in here for example uh, you can add some values or insert some records to your table at the time of initializing and but this video is getting a little bit long uh, let's talk about all of those in the next video see you in the next video If you want to insert some data into your database at the time of its initializing, you can create something called a, a room database callback. And the way you do that is by creating private static room database dot callback. Let's call it initial callback is equal to new room database dot callback. In here we can override uh, the onCreate method for this. Basically we have two methods in here, onCreate and onOpen. The onCreate would be useful uh, when we want to insert data at the time of creating our database. For example, in here I'm going to create an async task and I will insert the data inside that async task. Let's create that private static. I'm using this static keyword in here in order to avoid memory leaks because if you remember I'm receiving a context in here in this get instance method and this context can be different uh, whenever we call our university database okay let's create our async task let's call it initial async task it needs to extend from async task and we don't need any parameter in here so I'm going to pass void as the three parameters doing background but in here I'm going to create uh, a constructor for this class and later on we will see how it can be useful let's say public initial async task I'm going to receive the university database itself let's also create a member variable for our uh, student DAO in here let's say the student DAO let's call it a student DAO and inside the constructor let's initialize that DAO I can say a student DAO is equal to database dot a student DAO if you remember we have created this abstract method up in here and I'm using it in order to initialize my uh, DAO object later on inside the doing background method I can call that a student DAO object and uh, I can insert whatever uh, data I want for example a student out dot insert let's add a new student uh, we need a name in here let's say maysam and email maysam at maycode.org and also we need uh, a phone number now that I have created this uh, async task I can call it from here from this onCreate method of this uh, callback 
I can say new initial async task for its constructor I need the database I can pass the instance that we have created up in here then dot execute now that I have created this callback I can pass it to this room database uh, builder for example in here I can say dot add callback and I can pass my initial callback this way at the time of creating this database these two students will be added to uh, the students table. There are a lot of other things that you can do with your room database, but for now let's test and see if we can create our database successfully. In my main activity, I can create an instance of my university database. Let's call it university database. I can say university database dot get instance. I need to pass a context which I'm going to pass this. Now that I have instantiated this database, I can uh, use its DAO to, uh, let's say, retrieve the data from the database. I can say list of all students, let's call it all students, is equal to university database dot student DAO dot get all students. For example, let's toast the name of all the students that are being saved in our database. I can create a for each loop for a student s inside all of our students let's create a string uh, before this for loop i'm going to call it a toast message later on inside the for each loop i'm going to say a toast message plus equal the student dot get name plus maybe a backslash n after the for each loop i can simply toast that message But right now, if I try running this application, it will cause a crash. And the reason that it's going to crash is because I'm doing a database operation inside the main thread. Room database by default don't allow uh, any database operation in the main thread, but you can overcome uh, that default behavior by adding another attribute in here, allow main thread queries. If you add this, uh, now you can query your database inside the main thread but as i said previously in this session it's not a good thing to do database operation inside the main thread it's always better to create something like a async task and do the database operation inside another thread okay i think our application is ready to test so let's run it And as you can see, I'm receiving the names of the students that are being saved inside my database. You can do all sorts of operations uh, on your tables. For example, if you want to insert some a new student into your table, you can say university database dot students now dot insert. And from here, you can add a new student. Let's say Tom, Tom at Mako.org and a phone number. You can also delete students from your tables. But right now, if I try and delete instead of inserting here, it's not going to delete anything. Because if you remember, uh, when I created this student DAO, I said that this delete and update are going to work uh, upon the student's ID or the primary key uh, in your tables. We are not setting any uh, ID in here and this student in here don't have any id if you want you can uh, search for different students by their name but instead of uh, using this delete annotation you can create another uh, keyword for example in here i can say delete from students where for example let's say name is equal to the name that we are going to receive later on i can say void delete by name and I will receive that name this way we can uh, delete the student from our table by its name and later on instead of using this delete I can say delete by name and of course I need to change this one uh, to the name of that student for example Nisa Let's change our application and use a text view instead of toast so that we could uh, see the results better. 
just add some constraints to your text field so that it would be at the center of your screen and also maybe an ID in order to uh, initialize it later on in your Java code. Let's say private text view. Now that we have our text view, let's uh, set its text to the toast message. Let's say text view dot set text to toast message. I don't need this one for now, but before retrieving all the data from our database, let's add two more uh, in students into our database. I can say university database dot students thou dot insert new student. Now let's run our application and see if we can see the Tom and Sarah's name. And here they are. Let's try deleting Tom from our database. University database that student out that delete by name. Let's say Tom. And as you can see, Tom has been successfully removed, but because we are doing it inside on create, Sarah has been added two times. Let's comment these two lines for now. And also maybe this one. And let's talk about migration in Room database. If you remember from the previous video, I said that migration uh, is like that uh, upgrade and downgrade methods in SQLite database. Whenever you are going to change the version of your database, you need a migration. And the way you create a migration, is like this. You can say private static final migration, the one that comes from Android X dot room dot migration package. Let's call it migration uh, one to two. Is equal to new migration. Let's finish our sentence. Inside the migrate method, you can do all the changes that you need uh, for your database. And also in here inside the parentheses, I need to enter the old version and the new version of the database. For example, inside this migrate, I can add a column or maybe add another table. And as you can see in here, I'm receiving a SQLite database, which I can simply say database that execute SQL. And in here I can enter my SQL commands. For example, I can say alter table students add column maybe a grade integer i have tried this migration a thousand time and uh, it seems like it's the weak point of the room database migration is not still perfect in a room database and right now if i run this application but before that if i change the version to two and also add the migration in here for example, let's say add migration to the migration that we just created. If I run the application, it uh, wouldn't work. As you can see, I'm getting uh, crashes. And if you take a look at your run window or maybe logcat, uh, you can see that in here I'm uh, seeing some weird errors. It says that we need uh, some columns and we are out of order uh, for those columns. I have tried multiple ways, but uh, migration doesn't seem to work uh, perfect uh, in room database. At some websites, there are discussions about this. They say that uh, you may want to create a new table inside this migrate and uh, copy all of the values from uh, your current table to the new table. And after that, drop uh, the previous table and rename the uh, new table to the uh, previous table. But I tried that as well, and that one uh, doesn't seem to work uh, either. So I'm not going to discuss migration uh, any further. The version of Room Database that I'm using right now, which is the recent version, is 2.1.0. And uh, until this version, migration still has problems uh, in Room Database later on if they fix this. I will make another video and I will show you how you can migrate uh, in Room Database. But for now, let's just ignore the migration.
I need to delete this one and also let's change the version of our database to 1. If you remember from the previous video, I said that room database works great with uh, live data. But what is this live data? Live data is great for the times that uh, your data inside your database may be a local database or uh, in a cloud database. Uh, it's uh, constantly changing and you don't want to uh, observe all the changes into your database yourself. You will give that job to the live data. The way you create a live data object is like this. Inside your DAO object, you can create another query. Let's copy this one, delete star from students in order to retrieve all the students. But this time, instead of list as the return type, I can create an object of kind live data, the one that comes from Android X dot lifecycle. Live data of kind list of students. I can name this method live students. We don't need to receive anything as the inputs of this method. We are just going to call it later on. Later on in my main activity, I can call this method. For example, in here I can say live data of type list of students. Uh, let's call it live students once again. Is equal to university database dot student DAO dot live students later on i can create an observer for this live students for example i can say live students dot observe this method in here in here we need a life cycle owner and also an observer most of the time this life cycle owner is the activity or the fragment and it's useful because uh, live data is uh, life cycle aware and you don't need to be worried about the different states of your activities or fragments. For example, if you rotate the device while you are working with the application, you know that the activity would go to the undestroy uh, method and also after that it will recreate the activity. In those times, for example, when you use a text view, you need to uh, be worried about the data that are being fetched uh, to this text view, but for live data, you don't need to be worried about that because you are passing a lifecycle owner in here. It will handle uh, the lifecycle configurations uh, by itself. In here, I can pass this as the lifecycle owner, which refers to the current activity and also a new observer. When I pass this new observer, it will create this unchanged method. As the name applies, it will be used whenever the data inside your database uh, will be changed. In this unchange method, I can create my for loop and I will uh, set the text of the text view inside that unchange method. Let's move it there. But of course, I need to change this all students to the students that has been passed to this unchanged method. I don't need this all students uh, list, so let's delete that. And also, let's run our application and see if we can uh, retrieve the data from our database. As you can see, once again, the data has been fetched uh, to the text view. But uh, later on, after observing the live data, if I insert some new data to the students table inside my database, for example, if I say university database.studentdow.insert, Without any further action, if I run my application, you would see that uh, the text view will be updated and it will add the Madeline uh, to our text view. You can see that it's adding it in here. Even at the runtime, if for some reason our database changed, this text in here will be changed as well. For example, let's uh, mimic that action. Uh, I'm going to create an async task in here uh, for mimicking uh, the change to our database during the time let's say private class mimic uh, updating database is in test in this doing background i'm going to create an array list of the students and later on uh, we will see why
Let's add some students to this array list. Let's create a for loop and add uh, these students one at a time to our database. For a student S inside my student. Uh, let's freeze our thread for one second. I can say thread.sleep for one second. Or maybe two seconds just in order to see it better. But as you know, we need to uh, catch the interrupted exceptions. And after that, I need to say university database. But in order to access to my database, I need to change this one to a member variable. Later on, inside the async task, I can say university database dot student out dot insert the student that we are looking at. Let's just call this async task in here, new mimic async task dot execute. Let's also come in this line out and uh, test our application and see how log data can be useful. As you can see, my text view is updating every two seconds. That's the power of live data. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, I'm going to talk a bit advanced about room database and all the capabilities that you have in a room database. See you in the next video. Before we continue on to talk about more advanced things about room database, I would like to fix a little mistake that I made at the previous video. If you remember in my student DAO interface, in here I said that you can pass uh, an array of integers to your query uh, of your database, but this is not how you uh, pass the array of integers. You can say id in the parentheses and the placeholder of the IDs that you are going to pass later on. Okay, now that we have fixed this, let's continue on with our code. Like in simple POJO files, you can use compositions for different entities in room database. Uh, for example, if you have a model for the student table and also that a student has an address which contains uh, maybe the street, the country, the city, you can create a separate class for that address and later on compose that address class inside the, let's say, student or user class. Let's create our address class. I'm going to keep it simple. I just added uh, three parameters for the address, city address and zip code. If you want, you can change the name of the columns that are going to be saved inside your database. Like before, I can annotate it with uh, column info. And in here, I can say name to, let's say, uh, zip code. We need a constructor, getters as well. Let's create another class representing uh, an employee. This is going to be the entity for my room database. So I need to annotate it with entity. Let's change its name to employees, the name of the table. Once again, I'm going to keep it simple. So an ID, a name and email would be enough. And I can use the address in here as well, private address address i'm using composition in here but if you want to use composition in uh, your entity you need to add this annotation this embedded annotation this way rom database will create related columns for uh, all the fields in here and also all the fields inside that embedded uh, class okay let's create the constructor i don't need the id because ID is going to be primary key and uh, auto-generate, so let's annotate that, auto-generate to true, but I do need a setter for the ID, 
and also getters for all the fields. This was my entity. Let's create the DAO object. Let's call it employee DAO. It needs to be interface. It needs to be annotated with DAO. Let's create a method for inserting employees. And also maybe one for getting all the employees. Let's create our database class. I'm not going to create a challenge video for the room database. So if you have any problem with room database, uh, you can watch this video. I'm uh, creating all the basic things that we have learned in the previous two videos. Let's call our class company database. It needs to be abstract. It needs to be annotated with add database. For the entities, I can pass my uh, employee.class and also we need a version in here, which is going to be one. Our class needs to extend from room database and also it needs to have a public abstract method which will return the DAO object. So let's say public abstract employee DAO. Once again, let's create the singleton pattern in here. We need a getter for this instance, so let's create that. But of course, I need to uh, change this getter in here. For example, in here, I'm going to receive a context. And also in here, I need to be sure that uh, instance is not null. So if null is equal to the instance, then let's create that. I can say instance is equal to room dot database builder the context, the class, which is company database.class, and also the name of our database, which I'm going to say company database. Okay, let's uh, add the fallback to destructive migration, and let's build our database object. Let's quickly create a callback for initializing our database, private, static, room database dot callback let's say initial callback is equal to new room database dot callback we need to override the onCreate method also we need an async task in here in order to add data to our database private static initial async task but of course private static class initial async task extends async task we need the doing background method we also need the DAO object in here private employee DAO and also we need a constructor public initial async task it needs to receive the company database and in here we can initialize our employee DAO object is equal to database dot employee DAO. Okay, let's add few employees to our database. I can say employee DAO dot uh, insert new employee. Uh, I need the name Maysam. I never was an employee. Maysam at makewood.org and also an address which I'm going to say new address for the city let's say New York for the street let's say Austin and uh, some random zip code I just added two more employees to my database it's time to uh, call this initial async task from here Let's say new initial async task. We need to pass the instance. 
dot execute. And also we need to add this callback to our database builder. Okay, I think our database is ready. Let's switch to main activity and continue from there. This time I'm not going to uh, do database operations in the main thread. Instead, I'm going to create another async task in here. As the result of this uh, async task, I'm putting a string and we will see why in a minute. Let's initialize our database. Inside the async task in, in pre-execute method, I'm going to initialize that database. For the context, I can pass main activity that is. Later on in my doing background method, I can retrieve all the employees inside my database. But first of all, like the previous video, let's create an empty string. And after that, let's receive the list of the employees. Let's create our for each loop for employee inside our employee, all employees. Let's say employee string plus equal some text. After everything, you can return your employee string as the result of this doing background method. Employees. Let's overwrite on post execute method. Let's quickly add a text view to our main activity layout file. Or maybe we can use this one in here. Just I think we need to give it an ID. Let's initialize this text view in our main activity Java file. And let's set the text of the text view to the string that is being passed to this on post execute. Text view dot set text to s. I just need to uh, call this async task from my create method. Let's say new database async task dot execute. Let's run our application and see if we have created our database successfully. And as you can see, we are nicely receiving all the data about different employees. Until this point, there was almost nothing new uh, in this video, just uh, the composition that you can use in an entity. But if you are using composition, we need to annotate the class with this uh, at embedded. In working with databases, there are some times that you don't want to retrieve the whole object. For example, if you are using the information about different users, you may just want to access to the user's name and uh, maybe his password. For example, in here, let's try uh, retrieving the data uh, from the database, but only the name and the email of the employee but, and not the whole object. For that matter, you need to create another object. Let's create our class. I'm going to call it abstract employee. I can define as many fields as I want in here, but this needs to be synonym to the columns that you have saved your data inside the room database. Constructor and getters. Then later on inside your uh, object DAO, you can create another query. Let's create that. First of all, the return type is the list of uh, abstract employee. Let's call it get all abstract employees. 
and the query in here would be uh, select name and email from employees and because we are getting all the abstract employees we don't need a where clause but of course you can do that let's test and see if this one uh, works as well inside our main activity inside the doing background of this uh, async task I can create another empty string once again a list of abstract employees is equal to database dot employee DAO dot get all abstract employees our for each loop And after this for each loop, I can return this new string just to see that uh, this abstract class is working fine or not. Let's test our application. We should uh, only see the email and the name of the employees. Sorry, I need to append all these name and emails to the abstract employee string and not the employee string that we have created above in here this one. Let's run it once again. And as you can see this time I'm only receiving the name and the email of all the employees inside my database. This was another topic that I wanted uh, to talk about, the abstraction uh, when you retrieve the data from database. If you remember from the first videos of this session I said that SQLite uh, is a relational database, meaning that uh, different tables inside the SQLite database can have uh, relationships. And uh, if you remember from two videos ago, I said that room database is a wrapper around the SQLite database. But until now, we haven't seen the relationship between uh, different tables inside a room database. Let's practice that as well. I'm going to create another entity in here called hobbies for different employees and we will see how we can relate two uh, tables together, the employee and the hobbies table. First of all, like before, I need to annotate it with entity, the name, which would be hobbies. We need an ID in here. Maybe an integer indicating uh, the hobby's popularity. It's just a DOM table. I'm not going to put any logic in here. And maybe the name of that hobby. A quick constructor. Setter for the ID. Also, we need to annotate the ID with primary key and also auto-generate to true. We need getters for the columns as well. Let's quickly create a, its DAO, but before that, let's close all the tabs in here. Once again, add DAO. Two quick methods, one for uh, inserting and one for retrieving all the data from this table. Also, I need to change my uh, database class as well. First of all, I need to add the new entity in here, which is hobby.class. And also, I need to create uh, an abstract method for the hobbies DAO. Let's quickly insert two hobbies uh, inside our database. In this uh, async task, I need the DAO, so let's say uh, hobbies DAO. I need to initialize it inside the constructor. Uh, 
Now that I have inserted these two hobbies into my database, let's create a relationship between two entities. In order to create a relationship between two entities, there are two ways. One, you can create uh, the query in one of these DAO objects. For example, uh, you can join different tables together inside this query that you create and later on uh, retrieve or save the data in maybe an employee or abstract list. But this is not very efficient because once your tables got too many columns and too many rows, these kind of queries can increase the pressure on your uh, database. The better solution is to create uh, an intermediate table just to link these two tables together. For example, you can uh, create a table that will contain only two columns, one for the employee ID and another one for the hobby ID. You can define the relationships between these two tables inside that intermediate table and later on by the help of multiple joins uh, you can retrieve the data however you want. Let's create that intermediate uh, entity that I was talking about. I'm going to call it employee hobby link. As I said it would have two fields, one for the ID of the employee and another one for the ID of the hobby. Let's also annotate this one with entity. For the primary keys, I can declare them in here inside this uh, annotation parentheses. I can say primary keys. If you remember, I said that one table or one entity can have multiple primary keys. Let's define them. The first one is uh, the employee ID and the second one is the hobby ID. We will see why in a minute because both of these two needs to be unique. After the primary key, I'm going to define foreign keys. I believe we have seen the usage of uh, foreign keys, but we never uh, mentioned this exact name. Basically, whenever you join two tables together, the first table's uh, column that you are joining is the primary key, and the second table's column is called the foreign key. For defining foreign keys, I need to have another annotation in here called foreign key. For every foreign key in here, I need the entity one for the employee entity employee.class I need the parent column in here which is going to be ID inside our employee table and also I need the child column which is this exact table that we are in in here we know that ID is going to be equal to the employee ID so let's add that we need another foreign key in here, but in order to uh, add multiple foreign keys, you need to put them in a pair of uh, curly braces. Okay, let's add the other foreign key. Once again, annotate it with foreign key, the entity, which is going to be hobby.class. Like before, we need the parent columns, which is going to be ID and also the child column which is hobby id in this table this one it may seem a little bit confusing but basically we are creating an intermediate table just to link uh, two tables together inside this intermediate table both of the columns are uh, primary keys because they need to be unique. For the foreign keys, first of all, we need to define an entity. Then we need to define the parent columns, which is uh, coming from the entity class, and also the child column, which is coming from this intermediate class. You can define as many foreign keys as you want. If, for example, uh, you are linking maybe three or five tables together, you may have uh, five different uh, columns in here and uh, you can have five different foreign keys in here as well. Like any other entity, I need a DAO object for this one as well. So let's create that.
Before we continue on with this DAO, let's add this new entity to our database and we will be coming back to this uh, DAO object that we just created. Let's add this entity to uh, this database in here. We need the abstract method in here as well to get the employee hobby link DAO public abstract and if we want to insert uh, data into this table we need to uh, do it inside the, this async task as well let's insert a hobby for every one of these uh, employees but if you remember uh, I'm using the ID of the employees and not the name and in order to uh, get the ID of each employee I, once again I'm going to connect to my database inside this employee DAO I'm going to define a new query which will select only the ID uh, from the employees table where the name is equal to some placeholder the return type would be int let's say get uh, employee ID by name and also we need to receive the name in here this way we are uh, getting the ID of the employee by its name we need the same thing for the hobbies DAO as well let's quickly create that Now that we have added these two uh, methods to our interfaces, let's go to our database class. Inside the doing background of the async task, I can say uh, employee hobby link DAO dot insert new employee link employee hobby link. I need the employee ID first. Let's get that from the employee DAO object dot get employee ID by name for let's say Mesa let's minimize this project panel for now and also we need the hobby ID as well let's get that from the hobbies DAO let's get hobby ID by name for let's say soccer the same thing for the other two employees now that I have inserted the data inside this intermediate class uh, let's create our query inside this DAO object. For example, let's retrieve all the employees that their hobby is jazz concert. First of all, let's create the list of employees. Let's call it get jazz lover employees. For the query, I'm going to use multiple joins in here. Let's say employees dot ID and also for all the other columns and also you need to uh, put the name of the columns inside that address class as well it doesn't matter if you have used uh, composition or not the name of the columns are going to be the name of the fields that you have defined uh, in your classes Composition is just uh, for you to uh, have a better grasp when you are working with your Java file. Okay, let's continue in the next line. Let's say from employees, inner join, employee hobby link on employees.id equals to employee hobby link dot employee id. Let's continue in the next line. We are going to use multiple joins. Once again, I'm going to say inner join hobbies on employee hobby link dot hobby ID is equal to uh, hobbies dot ID. And finally, my where clause where hobbies dot name is equal to jazz concert. That was a long SQL command, but 
basically we are uh, defining the columns that we need from each table after that two joins after each other in order to uh, join three tables together and after everything we are uh, defining the condition which is uh, the name of the hobbies should be jazz concert once again you can uh, use a placeholder in here for example let's change this one to hobbies.name uh, is equal to the hobby name and later on pass it uh, to this method but of course I need to change uh, the name of this method let's say get employees by hobby I think our database is ready and uh, we just need to call this uh, method from our main activity let's try that inside this doing background uh, of the async task in my main activity first of all let's comment everything and also for now let's return null let's create our empty string let's receive the list of uh, the employees that their hobby is jazz concert database dot uh, employee hobby link down dot get employee by hobby we need to say uh, jazz concert let's create our for loop I'm just creating this text uh, to show the name, email, and address uh, of every employee that we have retrieved from database. After everything, I just need to return the string that I created. Okay, it's time to run our application and see if we have created our database successfully. But before running, I know that I'm going to get a crash and that's because we have changed the schematic of our database and for that reason, we need to use migrations but in this video I'm not going to use migration instead I'm going to uninstall the application and uh, I will uh, install it once again and as you can see uh, we are receiving Tom and Sherlock which their hobby was a uh, jazz concert if I change this one to maybe soccer we should only receive Mason It's working perfectly. Okay, I think this video is uh, getting too long. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to start uh, working on a challenge. If you remember from previous sessions, when we created uh, our second major application, which was called Online Grocery Application, in that application, I have used shared preferences instead of databases. And there, I said that when we have learned about database, uh, we are going to uh, have a quick challenge and change the shared preferences into a database. In the next video, we are going to start work on that. If you don't have access to that project, don't worry. In the next video, at the beginning, I will tell you how you can uh, download and clone the project from my uh, GitHub page. See you in the next video. I know that I said that it, this video is going to be a challenge video and it is going to be a challenge video but before we jump to our challenge I would like to quickly talk about another concept. Normally you can't save complex data like an array list of objects in room database. In order to save uh, complex data like an array list of objects into your room database you need to create something called a data converter. In this video very quickly we are going to create that uh, data converter and after that we will jump to our challenge for example in this simple project i have created a simple a student object which has only a name and email and also i have added uh, the room database and also json library into my dependencies we will see how we can use them in few minutes in order to create a, a data converter we can create another class in here Let's call it data converter. Because room database don't allow us to save complex data into tables, 
The purpose of this class would be to uh, convert the student class into JSON object and later on at the time of retrieving, convert the JSON file to the student object. In order to do such a thing, you need to create uh, your methods in here. For example, the first one would be to convert the JSON uh, to an array list of students. I can say public. The return type would be an array list. So public array list of student. Let's call it JSON to a list. And the input type should be a string. Let's name it JSON. We need an instance of JSON library in here. Because we are going to convert JSON objects to an array list, we need a type in here. We have seen how to create a type before. This interface type. Type is equal to new type token of kind array list of a student. A pair of curly brace and dot get type. After that, we can create our array list. Array list of student, let's call it a student, is equal to json dot from json. We need the text itself, which is coming uh, via the inputs of this method up in here, and also we need the type. After that, we can return the array list, return the students. But also for the room database to note this class as the data converter, I need to annotate my methods with uh, add type converter. The one without uh, as we will see later on how we can use type converters, but for now we are going to use type converter. Annotate your public methods with this type converter. As I said, we need another method to convert uh, array lists to JSON object. So the return type would be a string. Let's call it list to JSON. We need to receive an array list of a student. Once again, I need an instance of JSON library. After that, I can simply say return JSON dot to JSON, the array list that we just received. Once again, I need to annotate this one to type converter as well. That's all we need in order to save array lists in a room database. Later on, we will pass this class as the type converter to our room database. You can pass this class in the entity declaration, into the database declaration, or even into the fields of every entity. Depending on the place that you are using it, it will convert uh, the array lists of that specific type to JSON or maybe the JSON to that array list. Okay, let's move on from here and let's uh, clone our project from GitHub. If you have the online grocery application project, that's fine. You can work with that, but I suggest come to this GitHub page at github.com slash man and uh, download this project from here because I want you all to be at the same page as I am. And when you go to this link, uh, find the Android 2019-11, which is the number of session online grocery app, click on it and uh, click on clone or download from here. I suggest download a zip file. After you have downloaded the project, just unzip it, extract to let's say desktop, and you can import this project as an Android Studio project. This time, instead of starting a new Android Studio project, select this one, open an existing Android Studio project, and go to the path that you have downloaded the project. In my case, it's in my desktop. Select the folder and select this one with the green icon. This is our project. Click on OK and wait for the build to be finished. Because I have created this project uh, like one or two months ago, it's suggesting me to update my Gradle. If you have this suggestion, uh, please do update, it will be necessary. But if for some reason you wouldn't be able to update your Gradle file, come to this Gradle script in this Gradle wrapper properties and change this link in here, this distribution URL to the newest uh, Gradle version. You can find this link by searching uh, Gradle newest version for Android Studio. 
change this one and sync your project and after that your Gradle will be updated. Just to have a quick review of what this application is, let's run our application and see what it does. This was a grocery application which uh, in the main activity we have three adapters, two recycler view adapters, one for the newest items that have been added, one for the popular items and one for suggested items. These suggested items uh, would customize the suggestion for every user depending on different factors like clicking and watching uh, every item. We had a navigation drawer uh, in the left hand side which uh, you can see the different dialogues by clicking each one of these. If I click on every one of these items, I can add them to the cart. We had the whole uh, shopping process. If I click next, I can add my address and everything. The next page would be to uh, add a payment method and after that we would go to a fake payment page and would come back with a success or failure message. Also for every item we had some uh, options to add a review. For example in here if I click on it is add review, we can add a review and if we click on add it would instantly update the recycler view adapter in here and would add the review. We could have rate uh, our items from here by clicking on each one of these stars. And also uh, we had a search activity in here as well where we can uh, search for different items or different categories. In this application we have used shared preferences uh, to save data in a permanent data storage. Shared preferences is fine if you don't have a lot of data that are structured. But in this application uh, you can see that we have different models in here, one for grocery item, one for orders, I believe, one for review and everything. These are all structured data. We want to add them in a local database. All the connections uh, to the shared preferences is happening in this utils class. If you remember, I said that we are going to change this class and only this class. Uh, if we want to connect our application to database instead of shared preferences. So the challenge in this video is going to change this utils class to connect our application to the database. And this is the structure that I have considered for this database. I'm going to create three tables, one for grocery items, which has all the fields of that model, one for the reviews, and also one for the cart items. Depending on different methods inside the utils class, we are going to create different methods in let's say DAO objects and we will retrieve the relative uh, data. I'm going to use ROM database for this challenge for this application but feel free to use a simple SQLite database if you want. Okay, pause the video in here, go solve the challenge and uh, come back when you are done. We are going to solve it here together. The first thing is to add ROM database dependencies into your Gradle file. Let's add them in here. Click on sync and your project will be built. If you remember, we have uh, used Android X for this project. So we shouldn't have any problem because we are using a room database. If for some reason you haven't used uh, Android X for your project, always you can come to this refactor and select this migrate to Android X. Okay, let's start by changing our models. We need to uh, define them as the entities for our room database. We have a model folder in here. Let's start with grocery item. We know that it needs to be an entity so let's annotate it with entity. The name would be grocery items. I'm going to annotate the ID column to a primary key which its auto generate feature is true. And also I'm going to change the name of it. I can say at column info, let's say name to underscore ID. Let's change the name of some other fields, for example, this image URL in here. Let's say image URL. It's always better to not put uppercase uh, letters in your column names because in some databases it can uh, slow uh, the speed of querying data. So I'm going to change the name of all the columns that have an uppercase.
You can see that our model has an array list of reviews as one of its fields. At the beginning of this video, I said that uh, we can't normally save an array list into a ROM database. For this, we will create a data converter. And only for this, I don't believe uh, we are going to use data converters uh, in any place in our application. But let's ignore this for now. Our constructor is fine. But for uh, this implementation of the parcelable, I need to add an annotation in here, this ignore one. Basically, in your entity, you should only have the fields, the constructors, and the related uh, getters and setters. Anything else should be annotated with this ignore. If you don't annotate it with ignore room database, won't create your uh, database. This one in here as well. Down in here, we are using this to string. I need to annotate this one to ignore. And uh, we have two more methods in here. That's all we need in order to change this model to uh, an entity. But uh, the only thing that I need is uh, to ignore this constructor because we are not receiving all the fields in here. We are setting some of them manually. We need to ignore this one and create another constructor for the room database. Let's quickly create that one as well. We don't need the ID. ID is a primary key, but we do need all of other fields. Okay, let's change uh, the other models. We don't need to change this order object because uh, we haven't saved it into shared preferences. We just sent it to the web server and uh, after that we have received it with a failure or success message. So I'm not going to change this one. Let's uh, check the review. We are saving reviews into our database. Entity, name, reviews. Uh, let's change uh, the name of some of these columns. And also we need uh, an ID column in here as well. Let's change the name of some of these columns. We also need to add the add primary key annotation for this ID. Then we need to create a getter and setter for this ID as well. Let's do that in here. And our constructor is fine. It's receiving all the fields, but the ID, be, and we don't need the ID. Let's ignore some of these uh, parcelable implementation. We need to ignore the two string. We are done in this class as well. Uh, but for the cart items, I don't have a model in here. We haven't saved the cart items in a separate shared preferences. But we are going to save uh, cart items into a separate table. For that, I need to create a model for the cart items. Let's do that in another package in here. Let's call this package database file. In here, we need to annotate it with entity for the name, let's say cart items. We need only two fields in here, one for the ID of the row itself and another one for the ID of the grocery item ID. We are not saving the whole objects into our table. We are going to only save uh, the ID of the grocery items. Let's make this ID a primary key. A simple entity class, nothing more. Let's create our DAO objects. We need three of them. The first one for the grocery item. Let's say grocery item DAO. We need to change the kind to interface. Annotate it with DAO. For now, let's just add uh, two methods in here. One for the inserting and one for retrieving all the grocery items. Later on, we will uh, go to this utils class and uh, we will create all the methods that we need inside this DAO.
the return type in here would be a list of grocery items let's call it get all grocery items we don't need to receive anything with them okay let's create the review DAO For this one, for now, let's just uh, create an insert method. Later on, we will uh, complete it. Void insert review object. Let's create the DAO for the cart items. For this one, I'm going to create an insert method for now, but uh, we can't use this insert annotation because if we try to do this for example if we say void insert we just need to pass uh, an integer of kind id in here because in our cart items the id of the row itself is auto generate we don't need to pass that but the grocery item id we are passing it in here and room database don't uh, permit the primitive data types to be passed uh, to this insert annotation you can only pass classes that has been annotated uh, to entity in, uh, as the input types of this method in here. But you have another option in here. You can do it via this query annotation. In here you can say insert into cart items. You need to specify the columns. For example in here it was grocery item ID. After that you can pass your values and for the values I'm going to use a placeholder I can say void insert we need to receive the ID instead of using the insert annotation from room database we are adding it manually via helping this uh, SQL command okay let's move on we will come back to all of these DAO and uh, we will uh, complete them but for now let's create our database object let's call it a uh, shop database once again it needs to be abstract it needs to be annotated with at database it needs to be extended from room database for the database annotation in here we need the entities we have multiple of them so i need to put them inside the curly braces one is for the grocery item class the other one was uh, for the review and also we had one for the cart item we need a version in here as well which i'm going to pass on let's create three abstract methods in order to receive uh, the DAO object for each one of these entities i can say public abstract grocery item DAO grocery item DAO We need to implement the singleton pattern in here. Let's create the instance of this object, public, static, shop database. Let's call it instance. We need the getter for this instance. We need to receive a context. Also, before returning, we need to initialize this instance. If null is equal to the instance, then I can say instance is equal to room dot database builder context the shop database class and also the name of the database after that fall back to destructive migration and dot build also in here i'm going to allow the main thread because if i try to retrieve all the data from database inside another thread i need to create an async task for all the methods inside the utils class but that would take a lot of time this allow main thread queries would work fine for our uh, simple application but if you want you can create all of those async tasks but you can't uh, create them inside your utils class you need to create them whenever uh, you are called those methods uh, from different parts of your application from activities or fragments or different dialogues but uh, just for simplicity, I'm going to allow main thread queries. Let's also add uh, an initial callback in here. 
private, static, ROM database dot callback, initial callback, equals to new room database dot callback, override on create. After that, call the async task. But first, we need to create that async task private static don't forget this static it's very important for memory leaks private static class initial async task extends async task let's get the instances of different DAOs in here private and grocery item DAO I think this is all I need. Uh, I don't want to add any review or anything to the cart uh, at the time of initializing my database. I just want to initialize all of my grocery items. So that would be enough. Let's create the constructor for this async task. Public initial async task. We need to receive the database. Shop database. Grocery item DAO is equal to database. Uh, grocery item down. Inside the doing background, let's initialize our items. I'm going to uh, use this utils class and uh, get the items wherever I have uh, initialized my items. Let's find that method. It seems uh, these are the items that I have added them to my shared preferences at the time of initializing. So let's copy all of them. Let's copy this one from here into our shop database. I can say uh, grocery item DAO dot insert the text that we just copied. To save your time, I have added these nine elements to my grocery item table. That's all we need from this async task. We just need to call it uh, from here from defining this uh, callback. And also, we need to add this callback to our room database builder. Let's create the data converter class and finish off this video. Once again, I'm going to call it data converter. I need two methods in here, which will be annotated by type converter. Methods need to be public. The first one's uh, return type is an array list of reviews. I'm going to convert the array list of review. Let's call it uh, JSON to list. The input type would be a string, let's name it JSON. JSON is equal to new JSON. I haven't added uh, this JSON library, we have been using it already. We have uh, converted the uh, objects to JSON via using uh, this JSON and added them to our shared preferences. So I can use it in here. We need a type, new type token of a real list of kind review a pair of curly brace dot get type then I can say return json dot from json our json object and the type would be the type that we just created let's quickly create the other method type converter let's call it a list to json we need to receive an array list of reviews. Instantiate your JSON object. And after that, return JSON dot to JSON our reviews object. As I said, we can pass this data converter class to different parts. For example, if I pass it to the declaration of my database, it would be applied to all the application, all the entities and everything. I can pass it to every entity, for example, for this review entity. I can pass it uh, at the declaration in here. And also, I can pass it, for example, uh, in this grocery item uh, above uh, the declaration of this field in here. I can pass it in here as well, and it will be applied only to this field. For this simple application, uh, I'm going to pass it after the declaration of the database. 
because I'm going to use it only at one place and it really doesn't matter where I put it. I can uh, annotate and type converters, this one, the one with S. And inside the parentheses, I need to pass the uh, class that I just created, data converter dot class. Also, sorry for this get instance method. I think in the previous video, I have made the same mistake. I need to add the synchronized in here as well in order to uh, make this get instance method thread safe. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to start working on different methods in this YouTube class. See you in the next video. Okay, let's start by working on the utils class. But before that, let's close all these extra panels. Let's start from the beginning. I should have put some comments uh, before every one of these methods, but the names are descriptive and uh, we know that what we are going to do. For example, for the first method in here, add item to cart, we know that we need to add this ID to our cart tables. Let's comment all of these. But before we start working on the database inside the constructor, in here I need to uh, have access to my database. Let's define the database in here. I can say private static shop database. Let's call it database. And inside the constructor, I can say database is equal to shop database dot get instance. We need to pass our context in here as well. Inside the add item to cart, I can simply say database dot cart item dot dot insert, and I can pass my ID. That's all we need to do inside this method. The next one is update the rate. We are updating the grocery item, so let's create that method inside our grocery item dot. Add update. I can simply say void update and uh, I can receive the grocery item. Later on, inside my utils class, before everything, I can say uh, item dot set rate to the new rate. And after that, simply I can call database dot grocery item dot, dot update and I can pass my item. That's all, we don't need these extra code in here, so let's comment all of them. And also let's minimize this method. For adding a review, we just need to add a review to our review table. In here we can simply say database.reviewdow.insert and we can pass our review. But the return type of this method is a boolean. We know that we are accessing our database in the main thread, so whenever this line of code has been executed, means that uh, the review has been inserted into our database. So after that, we can simply return true. We don't need uh, the extra code in here, so let's comment all of them. The next one is uh, get review for some item. We need to create another method in our review DAO at query select star from reviews where grocery item ID is equal to a placeholder. After that, we can create our method. The return type would be a list of reviews. Let's call it uh, get review for item. We need to receive the item ID. In our utils class, then we can call this method. We can say an array list of review. Let's say reviews is equal to database dot review dot dot get reviews for item by ID, and I need to pass the ID. But in here we have a problem because we are receiving the data inside our review DAO, and the return type is a list. But in here, we are uh, saving them inside an array list. We need to do casting here. 
need to cast these items to array list of review. The reason that we are uh, retrieving the data via this list inside the DAO object is because the room database won't uh, accept the array list and it needs to be an interface like the list in here. Later on, we can use this list to cast it to different collections. For example, in here we are casting it to an array list. After that, we can simply return our reviews. Let's comment all of this extra code. The next method is in its database. We don't need this method at all because we are calling uh, an instance of our database inside the constructor. So it will create the initial values for the database for us. The next one is to get all the grocery items. We have that method inside our grocery item DAO. Once again, I can say array list of grocery item. Let's call it items is equal to Let's cast it to the array list of grocery item database dot grocery item DAO dot uh, get all grocery items. And after that, we can simply return our items. The next method is init all items. We don't need this one as well. We are initializing our database inside an async task in our database class. The next one is searching for an item. And the return type is an array list. Let's create that method inside our grocery item DAO. Let's say query select the star from grocery item where the name is like the name that we are going to pass. Once again, the return type is a list of grocery item. Let's say search for item. Inside our utils class, now we can call this method. We don't need this extra code, so let's um, comment all of them. We just need to return our items. Return item. The next method is to get three categories. We can create that inside our grocery item as well. Let's say at uh, query, select only category uh, from grocery items. We can also limit the record uh, to three. Let's say uh, a list of a string, get three categories and we don't need to receive anything. In here, we can say array list of a string, and three categories. Database dot grocery item DAO dot get three categories. After that, we need to return our three categories. And also we need to comment all of this. The next method is to get all categories. Let's create that as well. We simply need to copy the same, but we need to delete the limit part. Let's change the name of this method as well to get all categories. The next one is to get items by their category. Let's quickly create that as well. Add query. Select the star from grocery items. Where category is equal to the category that we are going to receive. It will be a list of grocery item. Let's say get items by category. We need to receive uh, the name of that category. In here, we can call that method. Once again, array list of grocery item.
The next method is to get all the card items and the return type is an array list of integer. Let's go to card item DAO and let's create that method. I can say query select the star from uh, card items. The return type is a list of integer. Later on we can call this method. Database dot cart item dao dot get all items. Return items. The next one is to get the items by ID. We need to do that inside the grocer item dao. I don't think we have one. Okay, let's quickly create that. Curity select star from grocery items. where the ID is equal to the ID that we are going to receive. We know that it's going to be only one item, so let's say grocery item, get item by ID, and let's receive the ID. In our utils class, we can call this method. Sorry, the input type of this method is IDs. It's an array list of integers, and we are looking for multiple items, not one item. I can change this one to a list of grocery item, and also we need to uh, change this one in here as well. I can say an integer array of IDs, and instead of equal, I can say ID in a pair of parentheses inside our IDs. In here, before calling that method, we need to and change this array list of integer to a simple integer array. I can say integer array, and let's call it item IDs is equal to new integer array, which its size would be our uh, IDs dot size. After that, we can create a for each loop for integer i inside our IDs, I can say item IDs with an index of i is equal to our IDs that get with an index of i. Now that we have this integer array, I can simply say an array list of grocery item items is equal to Let's cast it to the array list of grocery item database dot grocery item dao dot get uh, items by ID and I need to pass my item IDs but I think I need to change the name of this method to items by ID. Let's do that shift plus F6. Okay, let's see what else do we have in here. But before that, I need to return uh, these items and also comment these lines. In the next method, we are uh, deleting one item from our card. And after that, we are returning the array list of new items. So let's do that. First of all, I need to create a delete method inside my card item DAO. Once again, like the insert in here, because the ID is a primitive data type, we can't use this at delete because it needs a, a class that has been annotated with entity. Instead, we can use the query, let's say, delete from card items, where the grocery item ID is equal to the ID that we are going to receive. The return type for this method would be void. Let's call it delete by ID. From utils class, we can call this method. We can say database dot cart item now dot delete by ID and I can pass my item dot get ID. After this, I need to receive the new items inside the cart. 
I can say an array list of integer all items is equal to an array list of integer database dot cart item dao dot get all items and uh, after that we need to return all items next method is to remove all the cart items let's create that method inside our cart items DAO as well this time i'm going to define a new query delete from cart items and no condition uh, i have a typo in here let's say void delete all items then i can call this method from this utils class I can simply say database dot cart item down dot delete all items. We don't need to return anything. I just need to comment these lines. The next one is to add a popularity point to our items. If you remember, we have used this method uh, to add a popularity point to every item whenever the user buys one item, uh, and the amount of popularity point is one. As you can see in here, we are adding one popularity point after buying every item. For that, first of all, I need to receive an array list of all the grocery items. Let's call it all items. Is equal to uh, our database, but before that, let's cast it. Database.grocerytendow.get all items. After that, we can create a for each loop for grocery item g inside all items i think we have the logic down in here so i'm not going to write it down once again instead i'm going to change it let's delete this for each loop for now and also let's comment this uh, second all items array list we don't need the shared preferences because we are connecting to the database inside this uh, for each loop we are looking that if uh, the items id that we have received via the inputs of this method exists in our all items and if it does we are adding uh, one popularity point after that we are saving it inside a new item array list and after that we have uh, saved these new items to the shared preferences down in here but of course I don't need the shared preferences. Instead, I can say for grocery item, I inside new items, uh, let's say database.groceryitemdao.update and we need to pass the I object. And the return type of this method is void, so we don't need to return anything. The next one is to increase the user point if you remember, this method was helpful uh, when we wanted to create our customized uh, recycler view adapter. And in here, we are adding uh, some points to every item. For this method, I can simply say item.setUserPoint to item.getUserPoint plus the points that we are going to add. And after that, I can say database.groceryitemdow update our item as simple as that that was all of our methods and uh, i think we have changed everything we don't need this get id method as well because uh, the id is a primary key and we have added it to our entity so let's delete this one and let's see where in our application we have used it and uh, where would be the problem let's take a look at all of these classes the first error is in here we don't need the id in here inside the constructor that we are ignoring and uh, there is no error the order object review We have another error in here and uh, that's in main fragment and we have deleted this init database method and because we didn't need it we have initialized our database in shop database class so let's delete this one
seems like our application is uh, error free at least we don't have any compile time error so let's test it let's uh, run it and see if we have done well it seems like we have an error in here and the error says that it's not sure how to uh, cast the cursor to this uh, list of integer and that's because the return type in here is a simple array of integer you can't cast the cursor that have been returned from this SQL command to a list of integers instead it will be saved inside a simple integer array but I think we will uh, get an error inside our utils class let's take a look at that inside this get cart items we are receiving uh, an array list of integers let's change this one a little bit uh, for instance I'm going to say an int array of items is equal to the database dot cart item dao dot get all items and after that I can create a for loop for int i is equal to zero i less than items dot length i plus plus I need to create another array listing here before this for loop array list of integer all items let's call it is equal to new array list and after that inside the for loop I can say all items dot add the items with an index of i after everything I can return all items in a real world application uh, when you are working with your database uh, you probably wouldn't need an array list of integer to return but uh, I don't know for what reason we have returned an array list of integer so I'm going to create one in here and after that return it probably in a real world application a simple array of integer would work as well we have another array in here let's take a look at that and here is the same problem we can copy the logic from here uh, let's copy all of these and replace it with this one okay now we don't have any more errors let's try running it once again we have another error in here and error says that you have changed the schema but forgot to update the version number so we need to uninstall the application and run it once again apps and notification the name of the application was maimon uninstall ok and let's run it once again seems like our application is working fine at least we have received all items from here if I click on one item let's try adding it to cart and we are getting a crash the crash says in here that index is out of bound exception and uh, if you click on this utils.java you will be navigated to this line of code where I have uh, created this for each loop where the i is the element itself and not the index but I have treated it as the index in here and in here as well I need to change this one to a for loop and not a for each loop let's say for int i is equal to 0 i less than id's dot size and i plus plus I can say item id's with an index of i is equal to id's dot get i let's delete this one okay let's try it once again index add to cart it has been added to our cart but it has added the spaghetti not the Kleenex I think in my cart DAO I have made a mistake in here I'm retrieving all the items from my cart items but if you remember from my cart item model I'm saving both the ID and the grocery item ID I don't need to retrieve uh, all of the fields I just need to retrieve the grocery item ID in here uh, let's see what that does if we take a look at our cart 
You can see that this time it has been fixed. Now we can see Kleenex. Also, let's try deleting it. Let's say yes, it has been deleted successfully. Okay, let's try adding a review. Add a review, your name here. May some for the review, let's say it was fresh. Let's try adding it and it has been added successfully. If we go back and come back to our axe body spray, it should be there. Let's try searching for an item from our search activity. Let's say Kleenex. And as you can see, we can see the Kleenex. Let's see if we can see all the categories. We can see the categories, but we haven't avoided the repetitive of the categories. If we go back to our utils inside this get all categories method, uh, as you can see in the commented lines in here, we have avoided that problem. So let's uncomment all of these up in here. We also need to retrieve all the items uh, from our database. So let's do that. I really stop grocery item. All items is equal to I really stop grocery item database dot grocery item DAO dot get all grocery items. Of course, we need to delete this return from here. And I don't think we need this all category from here. After everything, we need to return the categories that we have saved in here. So we basically just uh, change this line from here to the line that you can see in here. I think we need to do the same thing for getting the three categories because in there we need to uh, avoid the repetitive as well. Let's copy uh, this line from here. Let's delete the return statement. And also let's uncomment these lines. But before that, we need to paste uh, our all items. And also we need to uh, get all grocery items as well. We need to change the type of this one to grocery item. It could have been uh, more efficient, but now that we have created it, it seems fine. Let's try running it once again and check if our category has been fixed. Let's go to search activity. Let's see all the categories this time. Uh, the items, the categories it are not repetitive. Also, let's uh, test the suggestion and the popularity point as well. The suggestion seems to work fine because we have clicked on the Axe Body Spray. It has been added to the beginning of this array list. If you want to check the popularity point, you need to buy some uh, object. For example, let's buy this cheese. I'm going to um, put some random text in here. Let's click on Next. Let's select PayPal as the payment method. Let's click on finish. Our payment was successful. And as you can see, cheese has been added to the beginning of this uh, element. Also, it has been added to the beginning of this uh, suggested items as well. Okay, everything seems to be working fine. But before I finish this video, let me just tell you that this is not a good architecture. Uh, to retrieve the data from your database or maybe add the data to your database. In future sessions, we will learn how we can write a solid code with a solid architecture in order to be respectful in the community and also for the good of our application as well. Also, you probably need to uh, connect to your database inside the, the worker thread and not the main thread. So that's another uh, bad point of this application. I just wanted uh, to make it simple, but feel free to uh, create an async task or maybe a service if you want from wherever uh, you want to call these methods. Okay, this session is done. I hope you have learned something about databases. In the next session, we are going to work uh, on YouTube and Google Map API, how you can uh, show different YouTube videos in your application and also how can you uh, work with different features of Google Map in your application. 
that's going to be a short session. I believe it will take two hours, but it can benefit you a lot. See you in the next session.